I'm Dr. Jeff Turetsky. I'm the Division Chief of Pediatric, Adolescent, and Young Adult Oncology at the MedStar Georgetown Cancer Institute. We actually see patients with an incredibly wide range of diagnoses from birth all the way through uh, up into their 30s. Patients get different types of cancers at different ages and there are sort of uh, peaks in when some of these different cancers occur. Um, there's a lot of cancers that are most common in small children, but those cancers often occur in people in their 20s and 30s. And so, example, um, patients with things like neuroblastoma or Ewing sarcoma, those diseases occur, Ewing's uh, not infrequently uh, in patients in their 30s, and those are diseases that as a pediatric oncologist, we actually have the most training in to take care of. We've seen childhood cancer survival from the early 1960s go from what would have been 10 to 20 percent with the modalities at that time, which were basically surgery, um, to somewhere in the 60 to 70 percent range today. And so the vast majority of kids are going to survive their cancer. Um, the challenge that I face is I think about how do we make the medicines better so that the survivors don't have the long-term and the toxic effects, and how do we then take that group of patients that isn't surviving and bump them into the surviving group. One of the things that we have right now is the proton beam therapy. So proton beam is a type of radiation therapy that provides an advantage over standard radiation therapy because of how the treatments um, react in the body. So standard radiation therapy, essentially, if you shoot the radiation in on one side, it comes out the other and damages whatever is in its path. Whereas proton beam essentially goes in and within a very, very short distance stops. And so this type of radiation is gonna really, really improve uh, the morbidity, sort of the side effects, if you will, of patients with particularly tumors in their brain and in their spinal cord. The goal of our treatment is to help a family so the whole family, not just the patient, um, both cope and get optimal treatment. And then when that treatment is over, that they can basically pick up essentially where they might have left off. Now we know that that's not always going to be true. We know that, that having cancer treatment and having cancer leaves a lot of additional questions in these patients' lives. Um, we know that they have a lot of long-term effects. Um, we're in a position to help them with that. But if you had to say what's the ideal, that's exactly what the ideal would be. When I meet with families early on, one of the things that I do is, um, is actually try to absolve guilt. Some of them feel very guilty that their child had cancer. They think about their own um, uh, youth. They think about their life prior to, getting, uh, to having children. Um, they wonder whether something they did, something they smoked or ate or drank or said, might have led them to having a child with cancer. And I think it's really, really important that people understand that the vast majority of childhood cancer occurs and we don't know why it occurs. We know from some studies in leukemia, um, in studies that were done with identical twins, uh, that the cancer cells were present at the time of birth in some patients with leukemia. Now what's fascinating is when they did the twin studies, the question is why does one twin get the leukemia and the other one doesn't? And we don't know the answer to that. Um, we also don't know why when they looked at the blood from newborns, the incidence of leukemia was much higher than actually ends up occurring in children. In other words, a lot of people end up having abnormalities that look like leukemia when they're born, but those leukemias never end up turning into leukemias. Um, they, they go away. And um, as we try to understand the origins of childhood cancer, um, one of the things that is really fascinating and, and uh, is, is now I think going to gain some traction because of the recent work in immunology and using immunotherapy is we think that at some level the body's own immune system or its own mechanisms are able to clear cancers in most cases. So the, the question then becomes, well, why didn't the person who get the cancer actually clear the cancer? Why didn't it go away when it occurred in the first place? And I think we have a lot of research to try to solve that. Most childhood cancer is curable. And the way that I tell families about this is I say, look, um, 
let's try to avoid going to the internet because you're going to get really scared. And let me tell you that um, with any given diagnosis, with any given treatment, there'll be some percentage. But that percentage is irrelevant to your child and to our situation right now because if your child uh, survives, then it's 100%. And that's what we're going to be shooting for. The treatment depends, of course, on what type of cancer a given child has. Um, sometimes the treatments will align uh, with a clinical trial, in which case we will uh, enroll that child if the family consents to it. Um, oftentimes the clinical trials are asking whether one treatment is better than another. So in those cases, we honestly don't know what's better. And the reason we do the study is to try to figure out the best way to treat the children. Um, and in other cases, uh, we do what's called standard of care. So we know what's been effective, we know what's been published, what's given the best outcome. And it's a combination um, of you know, medicine, so we call it chemotherapy. Um, some tumors uh, require surgery and others require radiation therapy. And uh, some combination of the three is what we'll typically use to cure children depending on the kind of cancer and where it is. The reason why we're extending into a slightly older age range, first of all, the National Institutes of Health, uh, National Cancer Institute, defines adolescent young adult cancer as ages 15 to 39. So they've already recognized that there is a need for improved survival in this age range in that patients who get diagnosed with cancer need to get to the right places so they get the right therapy because we know they don't survive as well. The other thing that happens to patients in that age range is they happen to be the lowest percentage um, group enroll in clinical trials, which also affects their outcome. And lastly, think about all the changes that occur in individuals between the time you're a late adolescent, 15 to 18, and the time you're around 39. Think about the independence issues. Think about, um, you know, your body doesn't really change that much physically from 18 to 39. And so what you really want to look for is what are the things that those uh, individuals need, how can you provide those needs? And so globally, we want to do an adolescent young adult program that's going to encompass, for example, the colon cancer patients that are being treated uh, by Dr. Marshall and his colleagues, the breast cancer patients by Dr. Isaacs, and we want to provide an umbrella framework that's going to work for patients in those age ranges. Adolescent young adult, defined as 15 to 39, um, is a challenge for any children's hospital. Children's hospitals are defined, their upper age limit is usually 18 or 21, and some children's hospitals will take in slightly older patients if they've been seen there for a long time. But if you think about it, when somebody comes along in their 20s with a diagnosis like Ewing sarcoma that's more common in, in young patients that pediatric oncologists are used to treating, that patient doesn't really have a clear place to go. And so what we can provide in an adolescent young adult program is a place for that patient to go. And being an academic uh, center and the only uh, NCI uh, comprehensive cancer center in the district and, and, and really in the, in the met greater metropolitan region, we have almost an obligation to think about how to better provide care for that age range. I, I almost would flip the question around when people ask me that and say, how couldn't I be a cancer doctor? Because everything that I've done since I was an undergraduate had sort of been geared toward this. I was exposed to pediatric oncology as an undergraduate. I did research in pediatric oncology as an undergraduate. Um, I did all these extra rotations in pediatric oncology as a medical student. I studied in England. Um, I did uh, rotations uh, at the Children's Hospital in Bristol in the United Kingdom. Um, and so everything that I've done sort of led to becoming a pediatric oncologist um, because it felt like the right thing to do in each of those situations. I had some experiences where people I knew early on died of childhood cancer, so that was sort of uh, part of the, ba the background, but it, I wouldn't say it was necessarily the only thing that drove my decision. And what people often wonder is, well, how can I do it? How can I get up every day and face some of the, um, the, the, the challenges? 
the vast majority of kids survive, and that gives me a great sense of hope. The other thing that I do personally is I'm intimately involved in a research program. I started doing research as a fellow in pediatric oncology, and one of the ways that I can get up and face the patients every day is that I'm directly involved in thinking about that next generation of drugs that's going to provide that hope for those patients who don't survive. One of the things that's critical is that we come up with new medicines. We need to find new ways of targeting childhood cancer. Um, we need to be creative in how we do that. We've spent a lot of time in the last 25 or 30 years, uh, I would say, maxing out the kind of treatments that we have. We've maximized doses to the point where we give patients bone marrow transplants if, they, if their bone marrows don't recover when we give them high levels of toxic drugs. Um, we've gone through various types of targeted therapies based on the targets that were known. And we've even given a lot of targeted therapy when patients don't even have the target. And what we really need is some creative approaches to coming up with the next generation of drugs um, for those drivers of cancer that we don't yet have good drugs for. I think it requires a lot of creativity and imagination. It requires um, many, many people putting their brain power together. And I think it requires a lot of interdisciplinary work. One of the things that I'm involved in here at Georgetown is I'm a member of an institute through the Department of Physics called the Institute for Soft Matter Synthesis and Metrology. Now you might say, what is an oncologist doing in the Department of Physics? Well, it turns out that how proteins interact and drive our cancers um, are informed by basic principles of physics. And my feeling is, is as we understand these very, very basic sort of basic scientific questions and we answer them, that's going to give us information that will help us think about how to create that next generation of drugs. Proton therapy is most useful when we want to uh, cause less damage to something on the other side that, of what we're radiating. For example, if we're radiating something on the left side of the brain and we don't want that radiation to go through to the right side of the brain and cause additional damage, proton is a good example of where that, that could be useful because proton therapy uh, stops essentially. It, it sort of um, hits the brakes. It doesn't go as far as regular radiation, which would tend to just go all the way through. And with children, there's a lot of places where we have growth plates in bones, we have different organs that are growing. We have a lot of vital places where we really don't want radiation to go in one side and out the other. We want it to stop so that we treat exactly where the tumor is, but we don't cause damage to what's on the other side, if you will. Well, at this time, a lot of brain tumors are clearly going to be better treated with protons because of the nature of the brain and how things are developing in the brain in young children and the nature of where brain tumors are. But I would also include all the different tumors that occur along the spinal cord and the vertebral column because a lot of times those are tumors that are not accessible to surgery. You can't take out certain ver vertebrae and still you know, be healthy. And so um, a lot of neuroblastomas, Ewing sarcomas, uh, sometimes even lymphomas are growing very near the bones, for example, and there's others. That's just a small example. And those patients will also benefit from proton therapy because, again, you'd be radiating the tumor, but you won't have the radiation pass through and affect the spinal cord or the nervous uh, tissue around it. You have a brain tumor and it's on one side of the pituitary gland, for example, if you radiate with protons and the protons do not affect the pituitary gland, then all the, the, the changes that occur with puberty and reproductive organ and growth and thyroid and all the things that, that need to be kicked off hormonally by pituitary hormones won't be, won't be damaged. Whereas if you use standard radiation and you, and, you, and you radiate through the pituitary gland, then that gland will get damaged and you won't undergo normal puberty, for example. One of the challenges when we radiate uh, tumors is that the radiation goes through and can affect the other tissues. Protons will typically stop at the site of the cancer. Children who are very young 
um, say maybe they're uh, eight when they're treated, if they're going to live to 80, they're going to have 72 more years at risk for cancer. So that for that patient, not putting them at risk for 72 years by not having radiation of normal tissue is really important. I think that having proton therapy as, as part of our armamentarium is a really important tool. The more tools that we have that are finally focused, the better off we are. So the better drugs that are finally targeted, fantastic. And the better radiation that's more finely targeted, that makes it even better as well. So, and, and we already, you know, surgery has already found ways of improving surgical technique. Um, and so all of the things that we can do that more precisely target the cancer and leave the non-cancer tissues alone, the better off patients will be. And the more likely it is that they'll come out of their therapy without risk of additional malignancy and being healthy. It starts by um, having a whole team. So we have a whole team that is critical for providing care to the whole family as well as to the patient. So um, part of that team focuses on the actual medical care provided, uh, the right medicines in, in a comfortable fashion and giving the appropriate medications to sort of reduce the nausea, vomiting and so on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to look at some of the other psychosocial needs that develop in children and their families and for this we have a wonderful art therapy program and uh, that's been very successful in helping um, children overcome their anxieties, uh, overcome their reluctance to wanting to come in for treatments. Uh, having these types of things available in the clinic, children want to come in. They want to come in because um, they feel there's something for them besides just the medicine. In addition to the medical care that patients receive here, we have um, an incredible team of child life specialists. We have art therapists. Um, we have psychology uh, support. And uh, we'll have a program in integrative medicine um, for patients and their families. All of these different modalities will help patients tolerate the effects of the treatments while they're getting it, and will hopefully leave them healthier when the treatments are over. Well, one of the things we want to be sensitive to is the fact that when you consider the breadth of adolescent young adult ages from 15 to 39 as the NIH defines it, we want to make sure that patients are treated in the appropriate space where they feel comfortable. Um, so as we grow the program out, we're going to have specific spaces uh, for those patients. Well, I think that we're talking about very rare cancers, and so by using a regional approach, we're able to go out and uh, reach those patients who would best benefit from the kinds of treatments for the specific diagnoses that they're going to have, where we're going to group them together in one place and give them optimal care. They'll also have opportunities to interact with other patients and families with the same diagnoses and also take advantage of the um, you know, the, the psychosocial support services that we're providing. And we're going to work closely within the network so that patients who do come down here for diagnosis and initial treatment, that we would work with their local doctors so that they don't have to keep coming back and forth, you know, into the city, but they'll be all part of this bigger network. And so if there's a network out there that can help both bring the patients in and then take care of them closer to home, that seems to me that will be really beneficial to the patients and their families.